Greetings from inside this old house in Hopalong Hollow. This is Jerry. Well, it's November. Gardening season, for me at least, is pretty much over. Aside from a few little things here and there that I can do in the greenhouse. So I just didn't know what I was going to do as far as videos for the rest of the winter. So I recall that many of you viewers have asked me because you know that I collect antiques and vintage items you know that because you see me using them all the time but many of you have asked me to take you on a shopping trip Stella what are you doing Stella you don't eat cookies <laughs> Stella, stop and um, the thing is I don't really go to antique shops anymore I know a lot of youtubers go to into shops and they take you on a little tour and they film everything and I just think those are great videos but I rarely go to antique stores anymore because I don't need to. I've been collecting antiques for such a long time that I really don't have a need or really room for anything else here in the house. And when I do purchase anything, it's usually something that I will search for on eBay. So I asked the viewers on my community post if you would like for me just to go through the house and talk about my antiques that I already own and maybe give you a few um, little bit of information on each piece and see if that would be of interest. And I really got a lot of response on that. I was really surprised at how many people are interested in that sort of thing. So this is episode one of the old curiosity shop inside this old house. So in this and subsequent episodes, what I'd like to do is just walk through the house, maybe stop at a cupboard that is full of a particular antique, talk about the items, tell you a little bit about their history, uh, maybe the price range that you could find them in, and why I collected it. And I just think that we will start out, because we're sitting here at the table in the parlor, I think we'll start out with this tea set that's sitting here in front of me. Now, if you've watched my videos before, you know that I love beautiful, artful dinnerware, teacups, and teapots. That's because it just makes it a lot more enjoyable experience if you're eating and drinking out of something lovely. So this is a set of Shakespeare Land China. And I don't think this set is particularly old. I actually have another set of this demitasse cups and done in more like a transferware pink but on each plate or cup there's an image of this is the blacksmith's forge areas that Shakespeare would have been familiar with there's not actually a theme park or anything like that called Shakespeare land but Shakespeare land simply means the dwellings the places mentioned in his plays and writings that he would have been familiar with and they are reproduced on these plates the plates are made by Myatt and Sons, uh, established in 1880, I think it is, 1880, Shakespeare Land, made in England. And I just love the images on the plates and the cups. You can see there again. Oh dear, my kitty cat is being so naughty. Stella, stop! So when I was looking for some extra pieces for this set, I was searching on eBay. I typed in Shakespeare Land, and then I happened upon this book, which is called Shakespeare Land in Shakespeare's Town. And it's got um, poems and writings and lots of information about the area in which Shakespeare lived, and a lot of beautiful illustrations and paintings. And Shakespeare Land, as I said, was not some kind of a, it's not some kind of a, theme park in England. No, it's simply the surroundings in which he lived and an explanation of them. I don't know when this book was written because it, believe it or not, doesn't have a copyright on it. That is very unusual. But look at the beautiful illustrations and the paintings. So I think this goes great with this particular set, tea set. Now I want to talk about another book, and this is special to me because this is probably one of the first antiques that I ever had. It has special meaning to me. My mother gave this to me when I was quite young because this was her book and it was her mother's book. And it's called, it's a little <laughs> really faded out, but look at it, The Five Little Peppers and How They Grew. And this is about the Pepper family, a mother, a widow raising her uh, little children all on her own. They're rather 
not really well off, but they are a very happy and loving family. And I love this book. And I used to read it a lot when I was little. I haven't read it in years. I really should get back in here and read it over the Christmas season or the winter season because they're beautiful stories. And I especially love the chapter about how they celebrated Christmas and tried to make a Christmas for the little ones with very, very little money. Five Little Peppers and how they grew. And this is a copy from, I think, 1880. Um, let's see. Well, it was written in 1880. Uh, this copy is from 1909. There we go. 1909. So this means a lot to me. And it's really not in very bad shape. I try to take good care of it. She acquired my love for old things, I think, from my mother. My mother will be turning 97 in December. And she still enjoys her house full of old things, absolutely loves them. And she did pass that love on to me, that and a love of history, I, I believe. She was one of those mothers that was, if there was an antique sign, she would pull in, <laughs> put the brakes on the car and pull into that place. And we were shopping for antiques for as long as I can remember. The first one that I ever purchased, actually, my own self, was a scrapbook that I found in a dusty corner in a very, very small little shabby antique store. It was made of black oil cloth, the actual scrapbook. It was made by a child, and it was, it had, it was full of newspaper or magazine clippings and the clippings were from really old magazines probably early 1900s and they were beautiful images all sorts of different images unfortunately I lost that scrapbook in a fire and along with many other special things but I'll never forget it it really was one of my first little acquisitions so I think we'll start right here at the front door of this old house now this old house is called a four square. It's a pretty typical and common American home. It's actually the quintessential American home. These were built between the 1880s and around 1915, 1920. Now, one thing I love about this little antique up here, one of my favorite things, it's so it's simple. A set of shop bells up at the top of the door. Four little bells with little ringers made of cast iron that make a beautiful tinkling sound. When you open the door, just a very faint sound, but these would have been used in a general store or a shop, probably around the early 1900s, to let the shop owner know that somebody had entered or left the store, obviously. This is something you don't find very often, so when I did see it in a shop for about, I think, $30 at the time, I had to have those. Those are pretty unique, I think. Another really great item is this doorbell. And the doorbell did not come on the house, but it is typical of the time period. And let me show you that it is a really loud doorbell. I'm gonna ring it and you're gonna to have to cover your ears for a moment because it's really loud. See what I mean? <laughs> I just Little love it. Porcelain handled ringer is responsible for that very loud noise on the other side of the door. I purchased this on eBay about 10 years ago. I love those little shop bells. Now, as I mentioned before, I don't really go antiquing anymore. If I want something, I just get it online. But there is one item that I purchased this year, and I purchased it from my friend Nancy because she had an estate sale. And it was this wonderful, incredible 200-year-old rug. Now, this is what I know about the rug. It's a very large oriental rug. You can see how huge it is. I purchased it from Nancy. She purchased it, she said, in the early 1960s. And at that time, it was already 125 years old. She found it in a newspaper ad from a woman who lived in a really small apartment and the woman had two of these rugs and several antiques. She had been a servant 
in the household of a, some people who lived in a Pennsylvania mansion. And when she left service with them, I guess she'd been a very faithful employee. They gave her this rug and another and some antiques. She was in need of money. And so she sold these items. So she sold this rug to my friend Nancy. And now it's here in Oblong Hollow. Let's take a look at this large cupboard here in the living room as well. This is called a step back cupboard. This is a handmade piece. I'm pretty sure of that. I purchased it over 30 years ago in Colorado and I love it. It's a very spacious, spacious piece with large drawers. Originally it did have glass doors on the front here, but I took them off to make it an open cupboard. And also down here on the bottom, it has solid doors, which I don't use. Now I'm storing in this cupboard pewter and Britanniaware tea and coffee pots and old books. And I did an entire video on collecting these teapots, so I will just link that below rather than repeating the whole thing. I'll just tell you a little bit about some of the things in here. A lot of people say, oh, I wouldn't want to dust all that stuff. Honestly, I don't have to dust that often. And if I had doors on these cupboards, they're open cupboards right now, but if I had the doors on them, I wouldn't have to dust nearly as much. But since I'm the curator of this little collection here, I don't mind going in and dusting these things again and cleaning them off with a wet rag and um, shining these things up if I have to, taking the cobwebs off, because then I have to handle each piece separately once again, and then I get to see exactly what it is that I have purchased here that I have in a collection and makes me appreciate it actually a little a little bit more to go ahead and look at these things again rather than just forget that they're there I sometimes notice things I never even noticed well, this little Britannia wear creamer right here with the etching on the side and the embossing along the edge I never noticed until I was cleaning this again the other day that there's a little cornucopia here and out of that is a little bird is flying out of it with the wings stretched out and there's the beak and you can really see the really lovely design along the edge when you have to clean these occasionally and the delicacy of the design and sometimes the intricacy of the design on these simple items so even this little lid popper right here is really sweet if you're new at collecting and you want to find something that's affordable and really interesting and comes in a variety, a huge variety of shapes and sizes, I highly recommend collecting silver plate, Britannia ware, and pewter teapots and coffee pots. This one started my collection. James went to Atlanta and attended an antique show and he brought three of these teapots home to me. That's what started this collection of mine. This little teapot is from 1899. It's called Britannia Ware. And you can see that it's etched. It's got this wonderful design along the rim here. It's got a really great little finial on top made of ivory. And I don't know what he paid for it, but he brought three of these home. But I can tell you that you can find these for as little as $12 and all the way up to 100 just depending on what you look at. The definition of a collection is to have at least three of something. Then you've got a collection. You can keep on going from there or not. It doesn't matter. I don't want to have too many of one item. I'm just not going to go crazy over any one thing. But I do happen to have a lot of these because there are so many different varieties and they're so very, very beautiful. So please watch that video where I talk about these Britannia Ware teapots and the pewter. But there are other interesting things on this shelf, in my opinion. And back here we have some wooden shoes. These were of interest to me because I do have a Dutch and English heritage. And of course, wooden shoes make me think of Holland. These could have easily been worn in New Amsterdam, which is New York, in the early 1800s. They were worn. They were very worn on the bottom. They've actually even been repaired, as you can see here. 
This was for a very small foot. This was probably somebody with a size four foot. And heavy, heavy socks would have worn these wooden shoes. I just think they're absolutely charming. And here's a super tiny pair, which probably would have been for a child much younger, maybe one or two years old. And I like them here on the shelf. Sometimes you can mix things together like this, and even though they seem like they have nothing to do with each other, it makes a nice juxtaposition on the shelf here. And if you're a collector, then you're also a curator, and you are creating a uh, like a museum space in your house. I collect a lot of this anymore because I've got enough. However, I still have a penchant for the little miniature sets, the doll sets, the toy sets. This tiny set of Britannia ware is just absolutely charming, so I still look out for these. And this set here is even smaller. What I also love, and many people collect, old books. Old books are particularly great if you can find some old classics. The lovely thing about this set is that I've got eight volumes. This is marbled paper. Now the spines are in bad shape because they've actually, on some of the books, broken off. But underneath it, you can see the papers that they used underneath the spine, which I think is actually pretty interesting. This particular copy was printed in 1843, and it is a series of Charles Dickens stories. There's Nicholas Nickleby, and this one even had a calling card set inside of it. But there are eight of these books. They're like, rather, they're fine on the inside. The condition is fine. But when you're handling old books like this, you've got to be pretty careful so as not to put any more stress on them than necessary. Here's another tiny copy with a leather-bound spine and marbled paper on the cover. And this one has a signature in the front. And this one is dated 1833 and has a lot of little etchings in it. And it's the famous story called The Watch Chain. I think these are beautiful on a shelf, carefully arranged. Another reason to collect beautiful old books is because some of the covers are just fabulous. Just look at the cover on this beautiful Cowper edition. Again, it's in rather rough shape. And when they're in this sort of shape, you can get them for a pretty good price. And you can repair these books, too. They don't have to stay in a shabby a shabby condition. You can take a class on how to repair, do book binding. Uh, this one has a signature in the front, um, 1886. And this is just simply a series of poems and stories. Let's see. Let's just take one more here. Another one with the marbled paper. When you see the marbled paper, you know that you have got a, an old book, and especially if it's got a leather binding on the spine there. But an old book will definitely have marbled paper, and sometimes the marbled paper will also be on the inside of the book. This is Compendium from 1844 of Ladies' Home Companion, which was a magazine, a very popular ladies' magazine. And these are just articles and stories from Ladies Home Companion magazine, 1844. But I must say, these look very good with these wonderful old teapots. They're just a great combination here. And let's look at one more set. When you can find old books in a set, that's really special. This is a set of Edgar Allan Poe books. And what's really neat about this one, it hasn't got a very exciting cover. I do like the fact that it's a red cover. It adds a little color to this, this shelf, but it's got a lot of etchings in it. It's got the thin tissue paper separating many of the chapters, as you can see. <laughs> you know, there's nothing like uh, on a cold snowy evening or a rainy evening sit back in a comfortable chair with a pot of tea and read from an old, old book. Read a classic from one of these wonderful old, old books. This one was printed in 1904. The Spectator, The Devil in the Belfry, Loss of Breath, all kinds of Charles, not Charles Dickens, but uh, Edgar Allan Poe stories. 
And we have several other old books up here, which I won't go into, but you get the idea. And move on to the corner here. We'll come back to the spinning wheel. But this is a piece of furniture which was really, really common in America, in a home around the turn of the century, which would be a pie safe. And it actually did keep baked goods inside. The punched tin panels here, they are punched tin, usually punched with a nail and a hammer. They were put together like this with a geometric design or some other more elegant design. This was a pretty common design right here. And if you open it up and look inside, you'll see it's kind of like a cheese grater. It's really, really sharp. Ouch! You don't want to touch that. And this would be, of course, it's books in here right now, but you could put your pies and your baked goods in here and keep them safe. And yet there was some airflow for the pie to, to uh, cool off. They generally have a little wooden latch like this. And I was lucky on this one to have a drawer in the bottom as well. And it's sitting on some fairly nice legs, about a foot tall, to keep the mice out. So these are fairly easy to find here in America. And they're called pie safes. This is the smallest one I've ever had. I once had a really great big walnut one. I mean, it was huge. And I, I sold it eventually. Sometimes I just sell things when I want to replace them with, with another piece. But I don't know what these cost at this point. It's going to be hard to tell you prices because it's been a while since I bought most of these pieces. So that is called a pie safe. How many of you have a pie safe? We have several old spinning wheels in the house, and I don't want to talk about those in this video. I want to talk about what is on top of the pie safe, which would be these lovely old dolls and this rocking horse. Well, one of the things that I've always loved to collect are old toys and games. And this is called a shoe fly rocker. This shoe fly rocker was probably made around 1905. In fact, I have one very similar in my catalog with antique toys in it. We'll look at that in a minute. But this is a little rocking horse, basically. For a young child, who would sit in the seat and spend many happy rollicking hours trotting across the parlor floor. And you can see that it's um, covered in a paper lithograph. This one's in pretty good shape, actually. I bet, boy, oh boy, this toy was definitely used for a very long time. It's quite worn. It's actually been repaired. And it's got these little metal medallion, medallions that are several of them are missing. I wish I had those. But you can still pretty much see the really lovely lithographed image of the horse. Inside the horse, or riding on the seats, is this reproduction doll. Sometimes a reproduction is almost as good as an antique. And this is a case in point. I purchased this little doll when I did early American folk art shows up in Pennsylvania. And this particular artist makes these wonderful dolls. I don't know if she does it anymore. I think her name was Donna Ball. And this little Civil War dress is just perfect. The look on her face, the little glass eyes, look at that tiny mouth, and that sharp little nose. Very sweet doll, um, which I purchased in 1991, something like that. But her hat, I did find an antique hat for her, which I think suits her rather well. This is a bisque doll that I purchased at an antique show over 30 years ago. When I got her, she, her face was not cracked. It has just cracked over the years, and she was practically bald. So I had to replace her wig, and I replaced most of her clothing because it wasn't very nice. This was an original piece of her clothing, which I do like. It's, it's, it's a little gauzy sort of overshirt. But I made the dress for her, and I made the apron. But she still does have her original pantaloons and sock stockings. No shoes, but what's really cool about her, her body is made with kid leather stitched together. 
her knees, her thighs are all jointed so that she does bend her legs. I would hesitate to remove this delicate pantaloon here, so I will not do that, but I think you get the idea of how she's how she was put together. She's got quite a pretty face, as I said. She's got little teeth, she's got glass eyes, and of course she is cracked, as I said. Now, if that doesn't bother you, and you don't have to have something perfect, dolls like this can be repaired. I mean, I have a whole basket full of China doll heads that are in all sorts of different um, stages of dismemberment, and <laughs> really, some of them are quite bad. But eventually, they could all be fixed. And a doll like this could easily be fixed. You can get her new clothes. You can sew her some outfits. You don't have to have get a perfect doll. And you could probably still pick up a beautiful antique doll for less than $30. Now this one happens to be in this wonderful catalog, which I absolutely love. Let's take a look. If you're like me and you love to collect old toys or games or dolls, that sort of thing, the children's stuff, try to get a copy of this. It's called the Great American Antique Toy Bazaar. It's a reproduction of all kinds of toy catalogs from the past, from 1879 to 1945. And I have found many of my items looking through this catalog, and one of them is that little doll right there that I just showed you. Now here she is. I don't know which particular doll she is, but it's a kid body doll, kid dolls with bisque hands and heads. You can see the prices of what they were in the year 1905 is when these were produced. Now this would have been a great catalog for a shop owner because it says right here that you could get a half a dozen of these dolls for $3.76. That was the small size. <laughs> they came in many different sizes, as did mine. Yeah, mine is probably, I think mine's a 17-inch doll. Now, what they cost in the, in the store, probably this would have been a rather expensive doll because of her size, and this would have been, maybe the upper classes would have been able to get this doll for their child. So probably a dollar, maybe a dollar, or a dollar fifty for the doll back in 1905, which was quite pricey. Now here, also in the year 1905, is the Shoe Fly Rocker. And that rocker in 1905 would have cost anywhere from a dollar to a dollar fifty. Not what I paid for it at that time. And honestly, I wish I could give you prices, current prices for these items, but I bought them a long time ago. And the way I look at it is half of the fun of collecting as antiques is going on a treasure hunt and finding the best deals that you can. You know, another place that's been very consistently good for finding old things and unusual things is Facebook, Facebook Marketplace. There's a lot of great stuff on there. So try to get this book if you're a toy collector. And I have a lot of games and toys that I want to show you in a future episode. In the case that when we go out antiquing, we're not really looking for anything in particular. We're just hoping that something that we spot will just speak to us, or a piece of furniture or some item will say, hey, take me home and we will find a place for me to be. Such was the case with this red desk. And I had no idea where I was going to put this old red desk or what I was going to do with it, and I really didn't have any particular need for it. But I fell in love with this old red desk with the funny little ladder back chair and the woven seat. It's red. I think it's, well, I know it's oak, but it seems to be stained or painted a deep red oak, as does the chair. And my first thought was that this was possibly a school desk, but it's really heavy. It has a lock on it. Uh, it's got these big bulky legs. And I don't know, I think it's a little elaborate to have been a school desk, but I just haven't been able to figure out its origins. So I really was drawn to this desk. I love the scalloping on the edge here, the little lock on the top. It doesn't work anymore. And the big chunky, yet rather ornate legs. And this is definitely just a piece of primitive country furniture for this house. I just wish I knew more about this piece. Now as far as this chair goes, this chair came with it. 
I honestly don't think this was the original chair that went with this desk, and that's because this is a Tennessee chair. This is definitely one of our southern antiques here, and the woven seat is oak woven. It's just really in pretty good shape. I don't sit on it very often because I don't, I don't want to ruin it, but whoever matched these two up together did a good job on the finish because the finish on this chair is just the same shade of red as is the desk, and it's also made of oak. So this old country chair and this wonderful old desk, these are two of my favorite pieces of furniture in this room. But the curious thing is, and there's a lot of room in here, as you can see, there's an awful lot of room in here. The curious thing is that I was watching a movie called The Patriot, it was that Mel Gibson Revolutionary War movie, and when they were all meeting, all the gentlemen were meeting to discuss the possibility of war, they were all sitting at desks just like this, just like this. Same design, same color, everything, same height. And of course it was a movie set, so who knows if they got the time period right, because it just doesn't seem to me that this desk would be from the era of the late 1700s. But uh, my guess is, is just simply probably late 1800s and Hollywood got it wrong but it's a great great desk and what's inside of it oftentimes when I have something like this I don't open it up for months at a time and I forget what's inside so when I opened up this desk to see what was here I wasn't surprised to find the old books what I was surprised is when I got down to the bottom that I had in here some extremely old newspapers um, one of them is a newspaper from Connecticut from 1827, but re what really gets me, and I don't even remember where I got this, is this old handwritten letter. And amongst all these old books, I found this handwritten. I think it's a, some sort of land transfer, but it was handwritten. It's hard for me to read it, but the date of it, it was in New London, Connecticut, on the 24th day of March, 1806. And it was in with all these old newspapers. Honestly, don't even remember where it came from. So, moving up to something on the wall. A very large sampler. Now, there is one item in this room that I did acquire from an antique shop this year. One of the few times that I actually visited an antique shop this year. And it is this sampler. Now, if you've been on my other videos, you will notice that I have a lot of samplers on the wall because I do collect them. But this one is enormous. It is 29 inches by 35. It is huge. And when I first saw it, I thought, okay, that has got to have been done on a machine. That can't have been um, hand stitched because, well, it was only $70. I mean, for that price, and it's not an antique, it is a, uh, obviously was copied from an antique sampler from 1817. This is in perfect condition. There's no way this is old. However, I have discovered that it was not done on a machine. It was hand cross-stitched, and she does have a signature down there on the bottom. LG in uh, made in 1998 and my goodness I just I think I got the greatest deal here the frame is very folk arty and very cool looks perfect for this room but this is such a great find I love it I will say this antique samplers are very very expensive and I actually don't own any that are terribly old most of my samplers are simply reproductions uh, hand stitched of course by different people that I've collected here and there and th I think the oldest one that I have is from 1910 but some of them that you can find are from the 1700s and they were simply a way for young girls to learn how to stitch to learn their alphabet and to learn all the needlework stitches which was a very very important thing for a young lady at the time but we'll talk about samplers in another video. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this bit of a show and tell, and if you liked it, let me know, and we will do some more of these.
from Hopalong Hollow Bend, this is Jerry, and we will see you next time. <laughs>